what we're going to talk about tonight and is the um, how to assess and repair a we'll call it a classic radio. We'll call them boat anchors, we'll call them vintage radios. But uh, tonight I wanted to talk about a particular radio that I've been working on, the Viking Valiant. And I get questions from time to time from people who are interested in old radio equipment. And one of the questions is like, where do, I, where do I get started? How do I pick out a radio that's a likely candidate to be refurbished or repaired? One that isn't a piece of junk? How, how do you know if it's working correctly? Do you need lots of test equipment or any kind of special gear or something like that? And so I want to try to answer these questions in a, in a very general way. But I want to use the Viking Valiant that I've been working on as an example to illustrate some of the things that I've been doing recently. And the radio that I'm going to be talking about tonight um, has been in storage for many years. I bought this more than 20 years ago, intending to get it working. Never did anything with it. I traded it to Bill, W9MXQ, who traded it back to me. And about then I decided I should do something with it. And so I did. So at the start here, this thing hasn't been powered up for at least 20 years, maybe longer. So first, uh, a little context on the Viking Valiant. Why, why is this a radio that's, that's worth working on or is it worth working on? And the Viking Valiant is made by the E.F. Johnson Company in the 1950s. The Johnson Company's been around for a long time. They started off in the early 1920s making radio parts. They got into commercial radio right around World War II. And they started producing ham radio equipment right after World War II. So 1949, they produced the Johnson Viking One, their very first transmitter. It was successful. It was a pretty good transmitter, but what was going on right after World War II, late 40s, early 50s, Everybody's getting television sets. So now you've got television interference. And nobody who was making transmitters at that time was really thinking about, yeah, what do we have to do to minimize interference to TVs? Okay? But it was a big problem. That resulted in the Viking II in 1952, a great transmitter, very popular today, lots and lots of them around. Easy to work on, very popular, covers the whole HF, uh, HF fan, but it has to have an external VFO if you don't want to use crystals. The John VFO. A uh, couple of years later, you get the Viking Ranger and the Viking Valiant. The Ranger and the Valiant look pretty similar. They've got the VFO inside. It's internal to the radio instead of being external. Johnson had a whole lot of other transmitters that they made at this time. They had a very complete line. And you'll often hear us talk about Collins transmitters or Collins radio equipment. That's you know, kind of the popular collectible radio. If you were a ham in the 50s, you probably didn't have Collins radio. But it was likely to be much too expensive. So this was kind of the affordable kind of everyday ham kind of gear. And it was it was very popular and it's still popular today. And just because I've got, I've got a pretty short list here, there's a lot more transmitters that they made. Um, Johnson was very in tune with the market. They realized getting into the 1960s that the big market was not ham radio. The big market was citizens. And so they got into citizens band and they got into commercial VHF radios in a big way and made millions and millions of citizens band radios in the 1960s. The company changed hands a few times like, like most of these companies. Uh, it's kind of gone away. The, the brand name is still around today. E.F. Johnson Technologies is a subsidiary of J.V.C. Kendall, so at least the, the name survives. So the Viking Valiant, um, this is a big radio. In fact, it's so big, I didn't want to bring one in here because they're, they're just it's too hard to handle. But it's it has a lot of presence, I guess. First off, it covers 160 through 10 meters, and it also covers 11 meters. Sam's used to have an 11 meter citizens hand allocation back in the 1950s. Uh, it's a powerful radio. It has 275 watts input 
on CW and sideband, 200 watts input on AM phone. Finals are three 6146s connected in parallel. 6146 is a very popular transmitting tube. You'll find it in lots and lots of different radios. The modulator is two 6146s. And it has the, the internal VFO. You can see the tuning dial that's you know, the, the big dial right in the center. That's the where you can, where you can set the frequency. It has a, a well regulated low voltage power supply, which adds stability to the VFO. Well, people often describe these old radios as being chirpy or drifty or something like that. And when they are repaired and everything is working right, they are not. They're actually quite stable and have a pretty good, pretty good signal. Now, one interesting thing that Johnson did with most of their transmitters at this time, you could either buy it as a kit or you could buy it assembled from the factory. And the Valiant uh, sold as a kit for $349.50, less tubes. You had to provide your own tubes. Why they did that, I don't know. If you could buy the tubes from them or you got to get them somewhere. For $100 more, you could buy this factory wire for $439.50. Now, $100 might not sound like, oh, it's not a big deal. Maybe I could just get it already put together. But keep in mind that that's like 30% of the price of the radio. So it's a significant price increase. And almost 500 bucks in the 1950s was a lot of money. You could have bought a car for that. That probably was uh, several months wages for most people. So you know, th these aren't cheap. But if you, if you had decided you wanted to buy a transmitter, and you didn't want to buy something really expensive, this, this is probably the kind of thing you'd get. And just uh, kind of to note, the, the one that we're going to be talking about is a factory wired radio, which you can tell because the tube sockets have rivets in them instead of being held in with nuts and bolts. Is there a question? Um, plate modulation? Plate modulation, yes. It's high level plate modulation. Now. Gary? Do you have any idea what the tube would have cost? No, I don't. I, and, and I was kind of wondering that when I was looking at this because, like, can you buy like a set of tubes for five or 10 bucks or was it 50 bucks? I, I don't know. I don't know what that would have been. That'll be interesting though. I'll have to try to figure that out. And I think the price of the tubes back then was around $23. I remember getting okay. into that when I wrote the article on the radio. Okay. Thank you, Bill. So suppose you're at the swap fest and you're walking down the aisle and you see a radio, it catches your eye and you wonder, maybe this one would be a good choice. Maybe this is what I'd like to work on. What, what can you do for an assessment of condition right there on the spot? To tell you, or give me some indication, is this a good, is this a good radio or not? And there's a few things that I do, and that's uh, what's on the list on the right there. And, and first off, just, I guess, kind of like buying a used car. How does it paint? Is it all rusty? Is it full of dents, dings? Does it look like it's in good shape? A really important thing paint-wise on an old radio is the front panel. These were silk screen. Most of that paint is very, very durable. Very, it lasts a long time but you often see wear in the parts of the screen that somebody touches. So like around, like on a receiver, usually around the volume control, you'll see that that silk screen is wiped off. If, I don't know if you can see it well enough in the picture here, but this has very good printing on the front panel. Everything looks, everything looks good. The other thing you wanna check for is, does it have all the knobs? It doesn't have all the right knobs. And that might seem like a, well, why would you be so concerned about knobs? If it doesn't have the right knobs, you can't buy them anymore. You have to find somebody, probably on eBay, who's parting on a radio and assemble the knobs for 20 or 30 bucks a piece. Okay. Well, that's going to figure into the price if you get a radio that, that's missing, missing some knobs. This radio has all the right knobs, but a couple of them are missing that little white tuning indicator. That's an easy fix, actually. That's a little piece of plastic rod that slides in the hole in the, in the knob. So that's not too bad. There is a little bit of corrosion on the front panel, but that's that could probably be touched up without too much. 
Um, always look for extra holes. Extra holes are hard to deal with. If you've got somebody drill the hole in the front panel for to put their favorite modification on, yeah, you're probably not going to want to keep it. If nothing else, it's a big hole in the front panel. And with, with these radios, documentation is really, you can find the manual for just about any radio online for free and you can download it. Uh, one thing to always ask when you're looking at one of these is, does the person selling it have any documentation that pertains to that radio? Like when I work on a radio, I keep uh, pretty good notes on everything that I do. And if I sell one, then those notes go with the radio. So you can see what the history is, what was repaired or changed. And that could be really helpful when you get further inside the radio. So now take a look at the back. Here's what we see. Yeah, it's not quite as pretty on the back. There's some extra holes. There's some missing screws. There's a actually has a bolt missing on the right hand side. And the cabinet is held onto the front panel with 14 inch long bolts. So you're gonna have to find one of those with one of them missing. I do happen to have this one uh, provided by Bill the V9MXQ with the radio. Um, and then if you note know, towards the bottom, there's uh, an empty socket. That's a nine pin socket, not an octal socket. And that's an accessory plug. So if you wanted to have like an external gadget of some kind that needed electrical power, you could steal some power from the transmitter. But to have the transmitter work, you have to have that plug in that socket. There's a couple of jumpers that, may, that, that connect up the internal voltages. So if you don't have that plug and you're trying to make this radio work, you're not going to have success. If you get this radio without the plug, you have to find one. And like the knobs, these things are going to go from 20 to 40 bucks a piece. Okay, so these kind of things figure into the, the price you might want to pay for a radio. Ken? Wouldn't it also be... If you're kind of up against the wall, figure out where the jumpers need to go, get on the inside. Sure. Jump where the back side of the side. Yes. Yeah, there's all, there's always a there's always a workaround for this. But if you if you want to keep it in the kind of in the original condition, I guess, then you, you want the plug. But if you can't find the plug or you didn't want to spend 40 to 50 bucks on the plug, yes, you could you could really jump around. So back's not as pretty as the front, but you know, all in all, it looks it looks pretty reasonable. So this, I wouldn't see any showstoppers so far. So now you get this radio home, and you need to start checking it out. The first thing to do is check the fuses. Why? Because they're almost always wrong. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've opened up an old radio and found the wrong fuses inside, and I don't mean wrong in that. They were undersized, they're always oversized. This radio had 20 amp fuses in the fuse holder and 20 amp fuses. Yeah. So, yeah, they're supposed to be eight amps. Okay. So, some, so that's that's an indication that somebody had a problem and they were trying to fix it and probably were not successful. But one thing Johnson did and several other manufacturers is they used these fused plugs instead of having a fuse holder on the back of the radio. Uh, normally, I would take off the old line cord and I'd put a three-wire cord on. I would not do that in this case because there's no place to put the fuses. Yeah, you'd have to come up with some other, like another fuse box or something like that. The, the cord is in good shape, so I didn't see any problem with keeping it. And when you, when you the, the, the test for the cord is you make a tight bend in the line cord, which you see in the top right picture, if you don't see cracks in the plastic, it's probably in good shape. So I put this back together with the proper size fuse on it, and then we'll go check the next part of the radio. So first thing is to look on top of the chassis. And you're checking, you're basically for obvious things. Is anything missing? Is anything broken, burned, charred? And we take a look at this and we see, you know, there's a, there's a tube in, the, in every socket. All of the, the, the meters are there, the light bulbs are there, the foils are there, nothing seems to be broken, the ceramic's in good shape. Is it kind of dirty? Yeah. No. 
That's pretty common. This has been sitting on a shelf for 20 plus years. Dirt filters in through the holes in the, in the, in the cabinet. And, um, it doesn't look so good, but it's not a big deal. It's, it's very easy to clean off. Uh, I don't clean the dirt off until I'm pretty sure I'm going to keep the radio and I'm going to work on it. So there'd be a few more tests I'd want to do. The exception to that would be around the high voltage parts of the circuit. You want to clean those off. You want to clean the dust and dirt off the high voltage parts first. And so we can just kind of stay oriented on the radio here as, as we go through some of the explanations. Uh, if you look at the, the picture on the left, in the lower left corner, that's the low voltage transformer. The lower right corner is the high voltage transformer. And the top center is the VFO. And the two really dirty tubes are the 6146 modulators, which are on the far left side of the radio. The high voltage rectifier tubes are on the right side of the radio, above the high voltage transformer. And that area in the center between the two transformers is the 360-146s in the final tank circuit. Now, one thing that you would notice right away if you were working on this radio is the transformer feet are both are, are bent on both the high voltage and the low voltage. That sounds perfect. Transformer. I don't think that was intentional. Wasn't that on purpose? No. No? No. And sometimes they do that to keep the field from causing trouble. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that was not the case. You don't you only see this in Vikings that have been Viking Valiants that have been dropped. Hmm. Yes. And this appears to have been dropped on its right side. There's a there's a small dent on the case. No real damage inside, but um, and interestingly, if you look at one of Bill Shadid's articles uh, from a few years ago, where Bill was talking about his original Viking Valiant from when he first started out as a ham, it ended up in Italy. And the guy contacted him, the owner contacted him and said, hey, is this your radio? And sent him some pictures. And that one is uh, kind of messed up inside from shipping damage. And one of the transformers in there has a, has a bad pulse. So. Fortunately, there didn't seem to be any other damage, but it just. Um... So now we turn the radio over and take a look. And the first thing you see here is well, it's really a lot cleaner underneath than it is up on top. That's also pretty common. This is this is you know kind of closed up inside the radio. It's not going to get dirty. Uh, the thing you really want to look for here was there any mouse nest? That's always a problem. It makes it really hard to clean up a radio if the mice were nesting. Uh, and we're doing the same thing here that we did up on top. Is it complete? Is anything damaged? Is anything burned? Any miss missing parts? Do we see any modifications? But well, you need to look pretty carefully because everything isn't going to be obvious. There's a lot of parts. There's layers of parts. You know, there's parts, wires. You can't see everything without you know, kind of taking a probe and moving some things around. A couple of things that uh, I did note here when I started taking a look. First off, if you go to the lower left corner where it says high voltage power supply, that black transformer looking thing under there, that's a choke. That's the high voltage power supply choke. That's not original, that has been replaced. The location of the high voltage supply, which is what we're gonna look at next, is that area outlined in red on the left side of the chassis. The electrolytic capacitors, which are those uh, long tubular things, there's two on the left side and two on the right side, the two brown tubes on the right and the yellow one on the left, those are not original, those have been replaced. And from the information on the capacitors, that was probably done in the 60s or 70s. So somebody replaced these a long time ago. And again, this is kind of pointing to, there was some kind of problem or problems in this radio that may or may not be fixed. And the reason for going through this and going through it in a lot of detail is you want to try to put a picture together and try to understand just what was done to this radio so that you have some idea of the history and what you might need to do to get it going. So you get into that high voltage circuit area under the chassis. And the first thing that I noticed, there has been some considerable damage. The edge of the tube socket is coated with carbon. So there was, there was a fire or something under this radio, fire arcing, some explosion. 
The chassis has been coated with carbon and something, maybe some electrolyte capacitor. There's some melted wires and something happened under here. There was a lot of energy involved. Did it get fixed? I don't know. Hopefully it did. You go over to the right of this just a little bit. And those two white wires, that's the filament wiring for the high voltage rectifier tubes. That's been replaced. So something happened under here that was severe enough that somebody had to replace the wiring for the filament circuit. And I, I was able to find this by just kind of poking around and there's, there's actually a couple of original wires sticking out of the wiring harness. And you trace up a little further and you see that they're, they're snipped off on both ends. And these wires were put in place. You better put those 20 amp fuses back in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was expecting to find something worse on, under this, on the underside of this radio. Um, I, I, but we'll, we'll, we'll get a clue on the 20 amp fuses in, uh, in just a minute here. These rectifier tubes are, are what are called 866A mercury vapor rectifiers. So they have a two and a half volt filament that uh, takes five amps. And the filament winding, even though it's, it's a low voltage winding, carries the full high voltage. So it's floating above ground at about 800 volts. So um, this is a, a common point of failure in some of these old radios too. It's, where the insulation breaks down over time and it get uh, bulk in the filament circuit. So somebody replaced these at some point. In tracing out the wires, I found, and uh, this kind of stay oriented, we started off on the left side of the chassis here, and now we're kind of at the center bottom of the chassis and with the area with that red circle. And I found that the replacement filament wires were shorted together. So when, when these were replaced, the two wires were laid on top of each other on this terminal strip, and there was a sharp nib of solder sticking up, and it, either the insulation broke down or it poked through the insulation. So I'm thinking this was probably the reason for those 20 amp fuses. And somebody was working on this radio. They did some repairs, and every time they turned it on, the fuse blew immediately because the filament circuit was shorted out. And maybe the guy didn't think to look at, you know, he, just replaced the wiring and probably didn't think that was an area where it would be a problem, but that looks like that's probably where one of the most recent problems was. Uh, so I, I re-sleeved these and put some separation on them and hopefully everything's good to go now. So, so probably a few words are in order about the mercury vapor rectifier. Too. What is a mercury vapor rectifier? These were really common in old radios. Um, these mercury vapor tubes as a technology started off in the 1920s because mercury vapor solves a particular problem inside of uh, lighting devices and vacuum tubes. And that problem is, is it, uh, or the problem it corrects is voltage, voltage drop across the tube. So if you look at a standard high voltage rectifier, high vacuum rectifier like 5U4 or 5R4, that has anywhere from a 20 to a 50 volt drop, depending on the tube of the circuit. The vaporized or ionized mercury in one of these tubes limits the voltage drop to about 15 volts. So you're not dissipating as much heat in the tube. Okay, you've got lower losses. Um, the filament, and you can see the filament area is that kind of whitish part of the tube, uh, which is not really white when you see it see it in, in real life it's actually going red but um, in the photograph it looks uh, it looks kind of white but that heats up the inside of the tube and causes the mercury to vaporize that vaporized mercury then is forms kind of an ionized plasma that has this constant voltage drop and that's where you get the uh, the, the benefit of the mercury um, Obviously, if it's got mercury, disposal is not easy. If, if one of these boards out, don't throw it in the trash. However, it's not hard to recycle them. You can take it to the same place you would take a compact fluorescent bulb, and they'll recycle it just like it's a light. 
One of the things to keep in mind, though, in using these is there's a preheat time. The manufacturer originally said 15 seconds. That increased a bit over the years, I mean, 30 seconds. Some later manufacturers said a minute and a half. Uh, the first time I powered this radio up, I had this on for about two hours to make sure everything was thoroughly heated up and thoroughly vaporized. Um, if you do read up on 866s on the internet, everybody hates it. And we'll tell you all sorts of terrible stories about how unreliable they are. Uh, I have found that if you do a, a, a long preheat on them and don't try to operate them tipped on their side, they'll actually work pretty well. Yes. So when the tube is in its whole state, is the mercury in little beads like it would be in a thermometer? Or you know, is it a solid liquid state? Yes. Okay, so what the question is if in the in the cold state is the mercury. Solid. Is the mercury a liquid, I guess, inside the tube? And the answer is yes. You'll actually see droplets of mercury inside the tube. Okay. There's not a lot, there's probably not much more than there is in a thermometer, but you'll, you'll see it either um, condensed on the glass or in droplets on the bottom. So did you say there's a time delay, circuit? What, what makes sure that you allow the mercury to vaporize before you start to You have to pay attention to that. You have to look at your watch and say it's been, it's been 30 seconds or 15 minutes or whatever. So, yes. So, if you just timer, yeah, it's so well, you're using your brain. You're making sure you don't flip the high voltage on before it's heated up. Okay. So, at this point, I've, I've kind of gone through this. I've got some questions on the transfer. So, I, I'm, I'm really concerned at this point that one or both of these transformers has got a bad winding and that this radio made parts <laughs> read. So I, I need to test the transformers. Uh, fortunately, testing them is pretty easy. You might think, oh, you have to take them out and do some kind of bench testing or something. They're actually pretty easy to test in the radio. You pull all the tubes out, you get out the manual. Johnson provided a pretty complete list of specifications where they tell you the resistance of each of the windings, and they also tell you the voltage that you should see on each of the windings. So you can hook this up, you can make some measurements, you can see if it's good. Uh, I also ran these for a while just to see if there was any heating and everything seemed okay. So even though it looked like there might be something wrong with the transformer windings, up to this point, everything's, everything seems to be okay. And at this point, I replaced the those old filter capacitors just in case. And then it's time to test the power supplies. And sure enough, they both work. So on the right, you see the rectifier tubes for the low voltage supply. On the left is the high voltage supply. Everything's working good. It's putting out rated voltage. And I'm very pleased that the transformers are not burned up or blown up. After the low voltage supply was on for a couple of hours, though, I did realize that the low voltage supply transformer was running pretty hot. That's pretty common in a lot of these radios. Many of you guys who have old radios, you know that they can get very, very hot inside. And I don't know yet if this one is excessively hot and is, is about to fail or if it's kind of running at its normal high temperature. But functionally, it's fine for right now. But there was a problem. In the process of testing these supplies, I turned them on and off. The third time that I turned on the high voltage supply, I could hear and see an arc, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, the internet was right. It's the 866s, there's an internal short, so I pulled out one of my spare tubes, put it in, turned the power supply back on, everything works fine. A little bit later, I was looking at the tube that I pulled out, and that's what you see on the right, and I realized there's an arc mark on the bottom of that tube. This is not an internal short. This is an external short. And there's a corresponding arc mark on the socket on the chassis. A standard fix for a bad phenolic socket in a high voltage circuit is replace it with ceramic. I didn't have any ceramic of the right size. And I also didn't have any phenolics to replace it. So 
I hunted up some ceramic sockets. They didn't quite fit. I really didn't want to start reaming out the socket holes and have you know worry about metal chips in the high voltage circuit. And that. So I did the number two recommended solution, which is super corona dope. Okay. Corona dope is a high voltage varnish, high voltage lacquer, some kind of high voltage paint that you put on. So I scraped off the arc marks on the chassis, scraped them off real thoroughly, painted it up with Corona dope, let it cure for a couple of days, put the tubes back in, cross my fingers, and it worked. So Where do you get the Corona um, You can order it on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a lot of solvents in it, so you only, use, you only use a little bit, but it works good. And you might also see a similar product called foil dope, which is for coating radio coils. That's different than Corona dope. So you got a high voltage circuit, use the Corona dope, not the foil dope. And as long as it continues to work, it's going to stay in there like that. Now, there's one more thing that has to be done here before this radio is ready to go. And that's a VFO resistor replacement. This is a common problem in all of the Johnson VFO circuits. And the resistor, which you can see it to the lower right here, R13, it's an 18K 2 watt resistor. It dissipates just under 2 watts. So eventually it's going to burn out. And they use the same VFO circuit in the the Valiant, the Ranger, and this Johnson VFO 122. So I've worked on this a couple of times already. So I, I kind of knew what to do with this. Um, you take it out, you take out the 2 watt resistor, you replace it with a 5 or 10 watt resistor that solves it. If you don't address this, eventually this resistor will overheat and will burn up, and then your VFO will not work properly or may not work at all. This one, you can see, looks like new. So my suspicion when I saw that was that this radio maybe has pretty low hours. And this has not had time to burn up yet. So kind of interesting. And you can see uh, in the tube, this is the, the 6AU6 right up above the resistor. It's still the original tube, still says Johnson on it. So maybe there's not 100,000 hours on this radio. I don't know. But it's replaced now regardless. So at this point, the, everything seems to be functioning in the radio. And the next step would be to see, does it actually put out, put out a signal? I'm able to hear the VFO in the receiver. The VFO sound, the signal sounds good. So I hook it up, uh, kind of a temporary setup here uh, with the receiver. The receiver on the right is, is a Collins R388. It's a military surplus Collins receiver. The Valiant's on the left. And the, um, if you look at the view from the back in the, the bottom part of the picture, the box in the middle is the transmit receive switch. So in our modern radios, where everything's all in one box, all this stuff happens inside the radio. You don't have to switch any. These old radios, you have to have a separate switch box that switches the antenna from the transmitter to the receiver. And also, uh, another function this one performs is to mute the receiver. So this turns off the receiver audio. There's a bunch of wires back there, and you've got to have the, you know, everything set up correctly. But it works. It just, it just takes more boxes in it to stay. Uh, I was pleased I was able to put this on the air, and about 180 watts out on all the bands. So doing pretty good. That's what's a... 200 and some watts in, and I'm able to get the uh, full rated current, which is 450 milliamps at like 800 some volts. So got a, a lot of power going on in there. And one of the things that you look for to see if this is working properly is can you get the rated plate current at the proper grid current? So the grid current is an indication of what's going into the, into the amplifier tunes. The plate current tells you what kind of power is being handled by the plate circuit. So with this one, it's supposed to be 8 milliamps grid current with 450 milliamps plate current. And I was able to get that. 
Uh, you also go through a step called neutralization. So neutralization is where you feed back a little bit of the energy from the plate circuit back to the grid, and it stabilizes the amp. On this one, the neutralization looked good at it. Um, the Johnson Manual goes into a lot of detail on all of these things that I mentioned. So if you, you know, I've never heard of neutralization, and I, need, I think I might need to do it. There's a very detailed explanation in the manual. It's, it's actually pretty simple. One little quirk of Johnson, tran or Johnson transmitters is the connection to the transmit receive relay. They actually use something that looks like a crystal socket on the back of the radio that you have to, you have to plug something in there. But years and years ago, they made some kind of a connector, but I have never seen it. So what you do find is what I show on the lower left here is a, a crystal socket with a couple stubs of wire soldered into it that fits into the into the socket on the back of the, the, the transmitter. So I, I had to make this out of an old crystal socket to connect up to the transmit receive switch. It, work, it works. It probably wasn't such a problem back in the 50s when you could buy these parts from Johnson. Nowadays, you see guys selling these things. They'll, they'll solder a couple pieces of wire into the crystal socket and sell a car. So you're saying place. Johnson used a lot of proprietary Johnson parts. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, Johnson was a major, a major manufacturer of high quality transmitter parts. So it's no surprise they would use them in their own radios. In particular, Johnson was noted for high quality ceramics and for uh, that were used for. Uh, well, you can see some of the standoff insulators in here, and there's a coil that's mounted on a ceramic form, and. They also did um, coils back when radios used to use plug-in coils, plug-in transmitting coils, you know, these big coil sets. Johnson made a lot of that. So yeah, no surprise you find Johnson proprietary parts inside. Okay, now, what is it about these 866? Some people love them, some people hate them. So they flash as the load changes. So you can actually use them as kind of a keying monitor. And it's still on. This can't stop transmitting. This can't stop. So that's one of the nice things about the 866 rectifiers that they got that kind of nice blue color and it flashes. It's just this kind of fun. It's probably saturating yourself with x rays. Uh, they produce x rays. They do produce quite a bit of ultraviolet. So yeah, we probably don't want to stare at them for too long. So. Nice. Yeah. The inside doesn't have a lot of bacteria or viruses. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just positive. Okay. So just to, to kind of end, end up here, here's a picture of a really, really nice like you go. This, this is Bill W9 MXQ's Valiant. It's uh, all nicely restored. It's uh, Looks shinier than even when it was new. And it's all similar appearance on the inside. Everything is just beautifully done. And if you're interested in this, um, Bill had a couple of articles in the ORC newsletter that where he goes into quite a bit of detail on his on, on his radios. What's a shattered device? What is a shattered device? Does anybody know what a shattered device is? On the, far right side. the thing on the far right side. Oh, <laughs> the only person qualified to give that description is Sutcliffe. <laughs> Derek? Not a E. Not a e. <laughs> it's a McCroppity. Well, the shattered device is the microphone, of course, which is the thing on the radio. The guy that's always listed in the newsletter is my proofreader. 
and I grew up together. He is an avid CW operator. In fact, he operates no phone at all. And he coined the word shattered device. And I can't remember. I was together with Sutcliffe and Drash and, and Pat Volkman and a couple of other guys one night. And I let that out. So uh, we, we always refer to that as a shattered device. So now everybody knows, without a doubt, what a shattered device is and where it comes from. Okay, anybody have any questions? Gary? How much time does it take to do this? Can't. Um, I don't, I really don't know. Probably 20 hours, something on that order, I guess. I, I don't keep, I think if I kept track of the time, I probably would too. So, because you, like many things, you start off and it seems like, oh, how long is it with that? You know, two nights later, I'm still working on it. So who knows? 20 hours at least. So you replaced all the electrical limits just as a matter of course. Yes. You didn't do a lot of just no. Yes. No. 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 What I do with the tubes is I take them out and clean the dirt off the outside, uh, and then clean the pins and make sure that the tube that I that came out is the tube that was supposed to be in the sock, and then I put it back in. A lot of guys. <laughs> Pull the tubes out, you know, swap them out, try different things, try substitutes. So you want to verify you got the right tube in the socket. I usually don't do any tube testing unless something doesn't. Bill? What did you, how did you clean the tube? Uh, well, as you, you saw the picture, the original pictures, they're, they're, they're just very dusty. So all I use for cleaning is I take a paper towel, some Windex, and just just wipe the dirt off. Put them in the Yes. And so, so Bill Bill mentioned that yes, if you do that, you, you can wipe the numbers off. Yes. So you clean the tube, but you don't clean the area where the numbers are. You just leave the dirt on that part. Otherwise, you will wipe it right off. Well, you can wipe the dirt off with the paint on the tube, depending on who made the tube. Some of the paint will stay on there pretty well. Others slide right off. Yes. Amberx tubes right off. Yes, I never experiment with that. I just make sure not to touch it because I learned the hard way by having a box full of tubes that don't have any markings on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. huh? If you ever been through this, and you're going to take the part of the very skeptical about anything that's being sold and not trust anybody selling it. And the reason I say that is the first thing I bought in uh, Dayton. The thing was working when he brought it. Oh, well. By golly, if it was working, it must be okay. <laughs> so there was a little more conversation and it sounded good. But what I really should have done was <clears throat> got down and looked through the bed holes to see if all the tubes were in it. That would have been a real good thing to do. Secondly, it's good to look at screws in all of the case where it joins together. If there's anything missing or something that doesn't match, somebody's been in there and you want to ask why. Uh, look at that power cord. That's really important. Um, you want to be skeptical about anything you're buying and just assume that it's not really complete. My greatest concern on rebuilding something is the power transformer. I must have 15, 20 power transformers. 
course, they don't fit anything I've got. But, but sometimes you give them, you keep them just because of this. I bought one rig, an HT32, that the guy was real honest. It was at our fall swap test. And it had no power transformer. And that's a common problem. So he used the net, he added an external kick part, but he didn't want much for it. And I could use some parts for other things. So I bought it, but I don't intend to restore either. The power transformers are hard to come by. And if you get a new one, which you can do, it is expensive. You should have bought something else. <laughs> but just look for all those things that just don't, maybe aren't quite right. There's a reason for it. And especially based on the price, figure that in the price. When you're doing the cabinets, one of the things to remember is if you take that panel, if you can mask it off well enough, okay? you don't want to lose the writing. But if you take the panel like the true value or its hardware, they can match the color exactly and mix it up special for you. Now, I think you'll have to buy at least a cord. But as long as you're buying just, say, Johnson equipment to restore, you might use, I don't know, half a pint of it. So, <clears throat> but be real cautious about things you buy. Thank you, Tom. If we have any uh, comments or questions from our Zoom audience. Uh, Pat, I got a question about that overheating R3 resistor. Yes, Michael. So if you had um, a radio, and you didn't know about the history, um, and you wanted to look inside and see what might be going uh, astray uh, by overheating. Is it realistic to uh, use one of those um, IR temperature guns to take a look at the various components, do you think, or is that, uh, and see if there's uh, anything that's getting hotter than it should be? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I can't say that I've ever used an IR temperature gun on my ham radio equipment. I have used it in my professional work. And uh, as long as you match the uh, emissivity of the surface to the sensitivity of the gun, yes, you, can, you certainly could detect hot spots that way. I suppose the way I end up finding them in a radio is either by looking or by smelling them or by my rule of thumb. You touch it and you see how hot it is. And these transformers do fail the rule of thumb. The, the low voltage transformer after two hours of operation, I cannot keep my thumb on for more than about five seconds. So it's it's running about 45, 50 degrees C. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm chuckling just like Bill there with uh, putting your finger in, inside and see if it's hot. But uh, I got another question for you on these old transmitters. Was there some either electrical or physical restrictions so that you could not transmit outside the ham bands? No, uh, not, not at all. Uh, the only restriction uh, in, in the radio that we're talking about tonight, the Viking Valiant, would be how far you could turn the, uh, the, the tuning dial. You know, you, you can tune it, and you could certainly tune it outside of the ham band. And with the... Uh, one of the radios I mentioned uh, early on, the Johnson Viking II, that had the external vehicle, that'll operate anywhere in the HF spectrum. So you can actually could tune that anywhere. You could set up your own um, short wave station or AM broadcasting station. Interesting, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much.